The topic that I want to discuss tonight is another purposeful topic before we get into all the topics starting next week. And this is another topic that holds us back, and it's the topic of pride. You have fear, I believe, on one side that holds you back from doing what God has called you to do. It's there to rob your faith, and you, you're afraid to step out in faith because you're fearful. You lack trust in God. And the other side of that is you're full of pride. And you may not realize sometimes how full of pride you are, but we all struggle with pride. And the moment that you think that you don't struggle with pride, you're probably being a very prideful person. But we allow pride to stop us from doing the things that God wants us to do. And so there's these two, two things that I believe that really keep us from receiving the freedom that Jesus died for his church to have. And I was just thinking about this even during worship. When it comes to even worshiping God with all that you are, in all of our classes, 101, 201, 301, 401 that we do, we teach on worship at the end of 201. And you know, I'm not going to go into this, this message. My goal is to be done in a half an hour if that would be a miracle. So pray for me. That worship in the Bible is an action. It's action. And, and every aspect of worship is action. And yet the modern church has made it that we just either like sit and sing a couple hymns or we just stand and we, you know, sing the song and that equates to worship for the most part, not realizing that it's the fullness of the body. It's, it's bowing, it's kneeling, it's putting your arms in the air, it's clapping your hands, there's, there's shouting. There's all these things that, you know, people would get accused of being crazy Pentecostals if we actually did what the Bible said we would do. But when I think about that, when it comes to really worshiping God with all that we are, what is the thing that stops people from worshiping God with all that they are? You know, even, even, you guys missed out, we had the Purim service, the first of the, the Messianic Jewish services uh, that start the year last Sunday. And it's always the smallest service. It's, on the, it's kind of based on the story of Esther. But after the story, we put on, we ended Sunday service with uh, people in songs, uh, God's going to get my praise. And then we put people in songs back on. And we just, people in songs, if you don't know that worship team, look them up on YouTube, Spotify, whatever you have, people and the and symbol songs, great, great worship music, just upbeat, powerful, it's kind of got a, a blues, folksy type, sometimes gospelish. I don't even know how to describe it, tremendous worship. It goes, we went like, uh, there was like 10 people left cleaning up the sanctuary, and it was old school Pentecostal, like... I mean, the old ladies that were, no, I mean that in all respect. No, that is in all respect. This is a respectful thing, completely. They went, they loved it. Like, I loved it. I loved watching them love it. Like they had, they had, there was a couple of flags out. There was people dancing and, and just worshiping with all that, all that we are. And see, that doesn't happen when we're gathered together in bigger groups sometimes. But why is it? What stops us from worshiping God? What stops you from worshiping God with all that you are? And I think about, as we were worshiping this evening, I was thinking about this story. This isn't in my notes, but I love this story. This is before Jesus goes to the cross, shortly before Jesus goes to the cross. He's with a bunch of people eating at a dinner. He's with Pharisees, and re these are religious leaders who know the Bible like the back of their hand, right? They have the Bible memorized. They're very scholarly. They're very theological. They are eating with Jesus. Now, just to sit and sup with Jesus might be worship in and of itself. You don't just have those guys there, but you have the little, the little bit of a lower class guys that are also eating with Jesus. Those guys are called his disciples, right? They were the, the workers. They flunked out of Bible college. They didn't advance to the theological schools that the Pharisees did. They were you know, a little bit more looked down upon in society. Of course, he had the tax collector and the cussing fishermen and, and all these guys. These guys are great disciples, and they're eating with Jesus too, and they're, fe they're fellowshipping around Jesus. And then you get this crazy woman that walks in. She's been a prostitute. She knows what it means to be down in life. 
She's seen some things that are very unfair in life, more than likely, because women didn't just choose to be a prostitute, usually. A lot of times they were used by men and left, beho- left behind, never to be touched by another man again, because society in those days wouldn't want a used woman. She's just a piece of property. They had problems getting jobs. They had problems working. They had problems providing for themselves even to put food on the table. But Jesus had touched her heart. And when she shows up at the dinner, she's worshiping with Jesus in a little bit different way. The religious leaders, they're sitting at the heads of the table. We are the head. We're, you know, we're here. We'll put Jesus in his little, you know, minions around on the side, you know. And then the other, the disciples are sitting there like, well, we're closest to Jesus over you theological, you know, smart folk. And so they're okay with it. And they think that they're pretty close to Jesus because they've been following after him. They may not have scripture memorized like the other guys. They've experienced some things in life, unlike the Pharisees. They're doing pretty good, and they've said, I do to Jesus. I will to Jesus, and leave everything behind and follow after him. But they're still not worshiping like the lady that's about to walk in the room. And when this woman walks in the room, she doesn't ask for a chair to sit at the table. She doesn't ask to to squeeze even next to Jesus. She simply walks in, and it says that she fell at his feet and worshipped him. In front of all the really smart people, in front of all the really good followers who had the same opportunity, same desire, and yet it was her, who knew what it was to come from the bottom and be radically changed by Christ, that would fall at his feet in front of everybody and not care what the religious leaders, the pastors, and the priests, and the Bible teachers, and the followers of Jesus, the servants of Jesus would think. And she wept, and she washed his feet with tears. She used her hair to anoint him with oil, a sloppy mess. And one of his followers would have the gall to scold her. The religious leaders would look down and say, doesn't Jesus know who this woman is if he's from God? Who is this that he's allowing to touch him? To touch not just him physically, but to touch his heart enough that he would say that this will be spoken of for all times. Now, I don't know about you. The Pharisees, they don't get spoken of like this woman. His disciples, even, to some extent, many of them don't get spoken about like this woman but what was it that she did that would cause her story to be told until he returns she shed her pride that everybody else had and worshiped him with all that she was and it is pride that will often keep us from touching the heart of God and worshiping him with all that we are Because we're too worried about what the person beside us, in front of us, or behind us would think if we really gave him all of our heart in worship. I think about Jesus going to his own hometown. He started in ministry. You guys, most of you know the story. Miracles, signs, and wonders are taking place. He's like, why don't I go back to my hometown? And the people that I grew up with, the people that I know, the people that we, we loved each other, you know, they can receive the same ministry from, from my father. And, and, you know, he had this heart and this passion for everybody. And yet when he steps out to minister to the people in his own hometown, it says that very few miracles took 
place. Why? Well, you could say that a prophet is without honor in his own hometown. That's where that scripture comes from. So there was a, a place of dishonor that was taking place. But why was that dishonor taking place? Because really, they looked at Jesus and they thought, who is this guy? Isn't he the kid that grew up down the street? Wasn't he the little neighborhood boy that played with my son? Like, who is, who is such a man as this that we would go to him for anything? He was just the carpenter's son. And so what was it that kept them from being able to fully receive what Jesus had to offer them? Pride. Pride would cause them to not want to honor him because to honor him would mean they would have to lift him up above themselves. Because to honor means to bow, to bend, to serve. And they were too proud to bend to their neighborhood boy. And it kept them from receiving all that God had for them. Tonight, uh, I'm just going to go through some scriptures and talk about the ways that uh, pride is talked about in the Bible. Then I'm going to give you guys a list. Um, from Billy Graham's book, he has this book called The Seven Deadly Sins, and it reminds us how pride takes many forms that keep us from really having that freedom that God desires that we would have. And so most forms of pride fit into one of four categories. The first one is spiritual pride. This is the sin that caused Lucifer to be cast down out of heaven. Here's what the scriptures say about that. Isaiah the prophet in chapter 14 verses 12 and 15 said this. How you are fallen from heaven, referring to Lucifer. O shining star, son of the morning, you have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, this is what he said to himself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. Jesus said, instead, you will, or Isaiah said, instead you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. And so what caused Lucifer to fall was his desire to be just like God. He lifted himself up. Pride got to him. In the New Testament, uh, we see Jesus condemns the religious leaders that I was just talking about for these same things. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, it says, Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence. Everybody say, great confidence. That's, that's what sometimes we call pride if we're trying to be righteous. I'm not prideful, I'm just confident right? And so Jesus told some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. So tax collectors, most of you know, were some of the most hated people in the days of Jesus, the scum of the earth. The other one was a religious leader. The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed this prayer. I thank you, God. Notice he's given thanks to God. That's good worship right there. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. We just took a dive. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. Now, I'd, I'd like to think nobody here has ever said something like that. That'd be pretty ridiculous, right? The truth is, how often, you don't want to raise your hand, have you been somewhere? It could be church on Sunday morning. It could be at your place of work. It could be at an event in our community. And you just think, thank you, God, that I'm not like that person. Or thank you, God, that I don't live that life. You may say it in a different way, but you're still saying the same thing. 
thank you, God, that I'm better than them. That's exactly what they were saying. I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector, he stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. Can you imagine somebody who took the time, the effort, and made the sacrifice to study the Bible, the word of God, so well that they would have it memorized? Someone who would pay the price of sacrificing, sacrificing eating food completely twice a week, every week, for 52 weeks a year. That's commitment. That's dedication. Somebody who understood that God is their provider and believed his word when it said that you cannot outgive God, that I'll, I will tithe my tithe into the temple and I will follow God's word and I will believe and put faith that he is my provider and I am obedient and trust him that he will bless me and provide for all of my needs. Don't, don't just think because the word Pharisee is there that we can distance ourselves from him. This is somebody who really followed after God. And yet he had this little slant in his heart that Jesus would actually say, you see that sinner that's looked at by the rest of society as being at the bottom of the barrel? You know what? He went home justified because he was begging for mercy. But the Pharisee returned home without being justified by God for all the things that he had done because of his heart. He exalted his heart. I don't know about you, but that's a scary place to be. Jesus goes on and says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Do you ever think about how we probably don't like to view ourselves as prideful, but how often we think we're a deserving people? You ever say, like, I didn't deserve that. I don't, like, not in a good way. Like, I didn't deserve for that person to just cuss at me. I don't deserve for that person to just cut me off on the road. I mean, I don't deserve to be treated that way by my boss. I don't deserve this in my life, you know, when people are, are giving me a hard time over here in my family. And, and really what you're saying is, yeah, you don't deserve the garbage. You deserve something better, right? Right? You're still a deserving person. I deserve things in life. I have rights in life. I have expectations in life. And so we lift those things up thinking that we deserve something, that we are a prideful person. This is the act of trusting in our own righteousness rather than the righteousness of Christ. Is God really our provider? Can we trust him to take care of us, to defend us, to pro provide for us in every way? Spiritual pride always will tempt us to view others with condescension rather than us being condescending or them being condescending towards us. Nobody wants somebody to be condescending towards you, right? But we will often be condescending towards others. The second one, intellectual pride. Paul condemns this, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. He's writing to the church. Everybody say the church. Not just a bunch of worldly people. Now, regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols, the church was asking, can we eat meat that was offered to idols? Yes, we know that, quote, I like this in God's word. He has, quote, we all have knowledge, right, about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. And Paul really slams those who think they have knowledge. And I, I just think that's, that's a strong statement. Yes, we all have knowledge about certain issues, right? But knowledge makes us feel like we're important, like we're somebody, like we're special, like we're deserving, like we have a right. But it's love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. 
Man, that is wisdom that comes with age, I'm telling you. This kind of pride manifests itself in arrogance towards, often, people that are a little less educated, illiterate, oppressed, while it forgets that our mental capacities for whatever we have were given to us by God and God alone, right? Number three, material pride. This finds its satisfaction in wealth and possessing a lot of things in life. What, what's the newest, latest thing that we can have, that we can acquire? And people who struggle with this tend to concentrate more on what they have than who they are in God. I will put more time into acquiring things in my life than I will on knowing God more. Now, that should be challenging to some people in here. You'll put far more into work than you will into knowing God and then justify it. That's scary. They feel superior to others because of their possessions. But Psalm 62.10 says, don't make your living by extortion or put your hope in stealing. And I, I know nobody's extorting or stealing that's in this room. And if your wealth increases, do not make it the center of your life. Don't let your life circle around that wealth. My life has come, become about working, receiving a paycheck, doing what I can to make money, the circle of life in our society. Number four, social pride. This is the condition that manifests, manifests itself in class. It manifests itself in, in racial caste and arrogance. So it's a belief that our family's origin or the color of our skin, even our position in life, makes us superior to others. So James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, I'm going to read through this as a pretty long section of Scripture. It's a warning against prejudice in general, but this is what it has to say. For all of those who are Republicans, for all of those who are Democrats, for all of those, no comments, for all of those who are whatever title or label you want to put on yourself, there should be no prejudice towards somebody who's just the opposite as you. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Well, we don't ever favor some people over others, do we? Should I throw out politics again? Should I throw out social class? Because, I mean, lo and behold, we would never think that we would look down upon people with less, but I see it in the church all the time. How can you claim to have faith in Jesus if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose somebody comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry and another comes in who's poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or I'll sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show? Now, I just want you to understand, that's just an example, a social example, economic example. That's just an example of many examples that, that James could have used. He says, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters, Hasn't God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ and whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But if you favor some people over others, the challenge is, can you think of anywhere in your life where you favor somebody over someone else? He says, if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. 
So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you've still broken the law. So whatever you say, whatever you do, remember that you'll be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you've been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Those are some challenging scriptures, and really that's only a handful of scriptures that I pulled out for this evening. I've heard it said that pride is like when the beaver told the rabbit as they stared up at this immense wall called the Hoover Dam. He looks at the rabbit and he says, no, I didn't actually build it myself. It was just based on an idea I had. <laughs> Somebody else built it. It's my idea, right? There's still that underlying pride that you got to be so careful about. And so quickly, I'm going to go over signs of pride. And here's what I want you to do. I'm just going to go down a list of things that came to my mind. My goal is not for you to necessarily hear my list and write my list down. My goal is that your soul would be stirred and that you would begin to ask God because really we gather together in order to receive from his word that we might be transformed into his image, right? That what I have for a list would only stir up a list in your own mind. We don't all struggle with pride in the same way, but we all have some struggle with pride. And so what is that that you struggle with? And just let my descriptions begin to stir up your thoughts and allow God to hopefully speak to your spirit about where you struggle. Signs of pride. Pride displays satisfaction in knowing right from wrong and having the answers. So that's somebody that always thinks they have the answer. I know right from wrong and they always have an answer. Pride finds it hard to admit when it's wrong. I know nobody struggles with that here. Hard to admit when it's wrong. Pride takes offense easily when questioned or criticized. Now, how often when we get criticized do we get offended? I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I never do. Right? Right? Like, that's really hard for me. I, it hurts when I'm questioned in a way that I feel like I'm being criticized. And more often than not, it's by the people that are closest to you that do that. And your pride rises up. Like, who do you think you are? And what are you doing when you say that? You're allowing pride to overcome. You seek to be honored by others and may look for ways to prove yourself. Now, I know nobody really wants to admit that you, you want to be honored by others, but you might admit to the fact that you look for ways to be able to prove yourself. You're driven to obtain recognition and get credit for things, kind of the same, same principle. Preoccupied with what I want and what I think as compared to what others want or others think. Now, that might look like somebody who doesn't listen very well. Or somebody who only listens in order to talk. My challenge, like even over the next week, I've been watching this lately because I've found myself do it many times, is when you're having a conversation with somebody, pay attention to when they start talking and what they say when they're talking to see if they really listened to what was said or if they were just listening so they could respond. And it might surprise you how often we actually only listen to respond rather than simply listen. A sense that you are closer to God than other people or that your life is more pleasing to him, or maybe if you have a ministry or whatever you do, you, you do his ministry to the Lord, that that's more pleasing to God than what other people do. That, that could also look like somebody who you think you're more disciplined. You know the Bible better than other people, or you, you fast twice a week, or let's get pharisaical, right? Legalistic. You pay your tithes, you do these things, and so you look at the fact that you're more disciplined than other people or more knowledgeable than other people. Signs of pride are an inclination to see more of what is wrong with other people. You're more inclined to see what is wrong with other people. 
or you're more inclined to see what is wrong with other churches than what is right with them. That's kind of that pessimist versus optimist when you're looking at people's lives or you're looking at churches, people's lives, ministries. Are you more inclined to look at what's wrong than what's right? Desire to see others fail to make yourself either look better or sometimes to feel better. Now, now I know that nobody wants to admit that you desire to see somebody else fail. But I, I don't want to give you examples right now. But there are plenty of examples where a lot of us, that's really what we're rooting for. You may not admit that you're rooting for something like that, but you know, when you start seeing somebody else succeed, you get jealous. When you start seeing somebody do well, then you start talking bad about them. You start pointing out all that's wrong. I was having a conversation with somebody today, and they said, why do, why do I hear a lot of people say that they hate Joel Osteen? Now, I don't want to get off on Joel, okay? But part of the reason is you'll hear pastors talk about him poorly. You'll hear people talk about him poorly. poorly, And there may be some underlying reasons, but mostly it's because they're jealous because he's successful. He's reaching a lot of people. And so you may not say in your own life when you see somebody else succeeding or you're struggling and wondering why you're struggling when, when someone else isn't struggling. You may not say those things, but that's really what you're, you're wishing. The inability to take a rebuke, especially from those who you judge to probably be less spiritual than yourself. And so I have a question for you. Think back on how you responded the last few times when somebody tried to speak correction into your life. What's your initial response? Pride has a philosophy that will not listen to other people. They only listen to God. Some people that struggle with pride, they have the gift of discernment. They're able to discern everything that's wrong with everybody else. Maybe it's a leadership style or a personality that's bossy, overbearing, intolerant of others. And so if bossy, overbearing, and intolerant is a description that's been thrown at you, you could have a pride issue. Nobody point their finger at me. Belief that you are on the cutting edge of what God is doing. Like you're the one that's on the cutting edge. You know more than people. This is what God's speaking right now. This is what God's doing right now. Everybody else needs to line up with this, with follow after this. It's the inability to join anything that you don't deem as being, you know, perfect or right before God. Here's some of the lies that we believe. Because I am free in Christ, I do not have to conform to anyone else's standard. Uh, I've had people that have said that actually to me. They're free in Christ, and they just think they don't have to conform to what standards I'm trying to put on them or the church, not realizing you're just asking someone to live according to God's standard. They can handle or they can see or they can understand this by themselves. They don't need someone else in their lives. They can make their own standard. Now, usually it's driven by some sort of conviction that's uh, because of a sin in their life or it's tainted by some deception. Another lie is that, you know, they have to know the, the answers in order to be acceptable. Now, and here's what I'm going to say about that. If it doesn't make sense, it can't be true. Do you know how much there is in the Bible that doesn't make sense? When I see God tell a prophet to run through a city naked, if that was me, I might have had a little too much pride to run naked through the city. I, 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 to be honest, like, I don't know. I'm like, I hope I would be obedient to the Lord, but could it be that, you know what, God, I don't want to take my clothes off and run through the city. Like, God, why would you want me to do that? 
Why? I, I have to know why before I'm going to be obedient to you. Right? There's the why. You've got to know the answers. You've got to know why. I, I was watching this sermon this morning, and this guy was talking about he was, he was like flying into a city somewhere, right? And he had to get there in a hurry, and the, and the plane kept flying in circles around the city. And he was so frustrated. He's like, God, you know I got to get there, you know? And he's talking about it flying around and around. He's like, I don't understand. You know that I need to get to this, this meeting or this appointment, whatever it was. And then lo and behold, they find out that the plane was in a holding pattern, because there was something else going on below. Like if it would have went down when he wanted it to go down, they all would have been dead. But he, he, he had to know, he had to have that why. He thought he, he deserved it. There was something there. There was a questioning of what was taking place. You know, that's just pride. Instead of just trusting that God is in control. Uh, the idea that sometimes we believe to be wrong is to be weak. And so we hide our weaknesses because we don't want to look wrong. We don't want to appear weak in front of other people. That's pride. We can't be real with each other. To be spiritually immature is to be disqualified for service in the kingdom. And so you look at somebody and think, oh, they're so immature. They shouldn't be doing that, you know, in God's kingdom. Some people even unknowingly tend to, they, they, they will do one of these three things. They seek to keep things hidden. I kind of just referenced that. Like, don't say that or don't let anybody know that. You ever grow up in a family where, like, your family kind of kept things secret? You didn't want anybody to really know what was going on? Or you do that in your own relationships, right? I had a friend of mine that went to a church over the hill for 20-some years, and that was part of his reasoning. Why? Is he didn't really want people to know what was going on in his family's life. They'd prefer to hide what was going on in their lives, their personal lives, their family lives. And what is that? That's pride. And we'll often label it like we're just a private people. I just like my privacy. Now the truth is you just don't really want anybody to know you because you have pride. And the last one is this, being stubborn and acknowledging needs or the need to change. Like you really don't want anybody to know your needs. Or you don't want them to know that you have a need to change. And here's a truth for you. God's heart, which is what I hope we all want, will be fully known as I humble myself before him and others. I'm going to try and make this fast. I'm sorry. The last thing I want to talk about is the Savior complex. And so, I'm not going to go into this too much, but, but over the last 30 days, I've talked about this last couple of Sundays, I'll talk about it over the next several weeks of things that I feel like God showed me and spoke to my heart as I took 30 days off. Uh, last year, I think I said this a couple of times, God gave me a word. If you pray at the beginning of every year, I think God gives you a word. Uh, and he will give you a word if that's what you want. And I got this word, I didn't really pray for it, I just got it, and it was humility, and I didn't really want it. And I was like, God, why are you just drilling humility into my spirit? And so I really thought about it. And there was things in my life that I realized, okay, I probably need to work on humility here and humility there. And, and some of it had to do with competitiveness in my life, competitiveness that, that stems from my past. You know, growing up, being a wrestler, I liked to win. I did not like losing. I was a little cocky and arrogant at times. And, and then that came out with my friends in that way that you joke around, but you're joking around and, and you're joking around in a cocky way. And, and so then, you know, those jokes, you know, sometimes come off still to day in ways that sound arrogant or cocky or, you know, like they probably shouldn't. There are things that my wife tells me I shouldn't joke about. Some of you guys understand that, right? So I thought God probably wanted me to work on those jokes. You know, quit, quit joking around like that. Quit giving place to the enemy or potential opportunity for him by, by acting, acting like you're being cocky or you're better or you're, even if you are joking around. So I really thought that's what God was, was working on. Uh, working on, wanted me to work on in my life. And so, you know, some of those other issues is, is this, and, and some of you may you not be as cocky as I once was. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to throw this out there because there's the opposite. And sometimes we all function in this manner, that if I don't think that I can win or that I'll be successful at something, then I often won't even try. 
Oh, I don't like bowling. Why don't you like bowling? Because I'm no good at it. Throw whatever you want in there. Why don't you try it? Why don't you do it? Because you're being prideful. Because you think it's about looking good. You don't want to look bad. You don't want to fail. Instead of trying something new and just enjoying time together, which is really what it's all about. And so there's certain things I won't even do in ministry. I don't, want to t- I, I don't like doing some things in ministry, and there's some things I won't do because I don't want to fail. I don't want to be humiliated. And so I really thought God was working on all of these things in my life, and, and all of those things are true, and they're things that I continue to need to work on to this day. But it wasn't until January that a larger issue became known in my life. And that was in, in working with people in our community and counseling and those types of things. I would, I would get frustrated at people that I think are, are mature Christians that aren't biblically doing what they know to do. And then you feel like you're a babysitter. And my job isn't to babysit people, isn't to encourage the mature. I always thought the mature should be encouraging those who are young in the faith, uh, counseling with people. And, and people would say, oh, I don't believe that about the Bible. And, and so then you think, why in the world am I even spending my time counseling with people? And so, you know, there, I started pointing fingers at other people. And you know what happens when you start pointing fingers at everybody else? Then God quickly makes you aware of the fact that really it all comes back to you. And so while I was on, on vacation and I took a break, I really felt like God was showing me that I have a savior complex. I've decided somewhere along the way that it was my responsibility to make sure that people are doing what they should be doing according to his word. I decided somewhere along the way that I could counsel people and help people. I decided somewhere along the way that I could talk to people and help them be transformed and help bring growth into their life. And I felt like God was showing me like, hey, Corey, I'm God. You're not. That's not what I've asked of you. And so some scriptures stood out, and I'm going to read through them real quick, and then we're going to do, do something special. Mark 4, 26 through 29, Jesus said, The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Everybody say scattered seed. seed. Night and day while he's asleep or awake, it doesn't even matter, the seed sprouts and grows. Notice he's not working, he's asleep, he could be awake, there may be something going on, but the seed sprouts and grows, but he doesn't understand how it happens. Like he's not involved in the process. He doesn't even get how it happens. I don't quite understand how this happens. I just was faithful to scatter the seed, and then something happened. It wasn't even his responsibility. The earth produces the crops on its own. First, the leaf of blade pushes through. Then the heads of the wheat are formed. Finally, the grain ripens like this miraculous thing takes shape out of this little miracle seed. As soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes, and he harvests it. Say, harvest it. He harvests it with a sickle, for the harvest time has come. So what does he do? In the process of something growing, he only did two things. Actually, he did three things. He planted seed and just scattered seed, and he harvested the seed, harvested the fruit at the end, right? In the middle, he pretty much slept and was awake and wondered how this process even works. So all he was asked to do is scatter seed. We know according to God's word, that that seed is representative of his word. Just scatter my word, who I am, to people. It's not your job to bring the growth. You just rest in the fact that I will bring growth, and you be ready to harvest it when that growth comes. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 9, Paul, the church is divided over who the better leaders are, And he says, you know what, I planted the seed in your hearts. Paul did. He preached the word of God to those that were in Corinth. He said, Apollos came and he watered it, but it was God who made it grow. Everybody say, God made it grow. Like Paul, the great apostle that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, doesn't even claim to be the one that helped people grow. All he did was scatter the seed. Apollos did some watering with the word. However, it was God that made it grow. Verse 7, it's not important who does the planting. Well, notice, the, notice now what he just said. I'm not important. My job's to scatter the seed, just scatter the seed. It's not about how important I am in scattering the seed. Every one of us, our job is simply to scatter the seed of, of God's word. We're no more important than anybody else. 
What is important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters, they work together with the same purpose. Both will be rewarded for their own hard work, for we are both God's workers, and you are God's field, you are God's building. And so there's this great explanation about it. But who brings the growth? Who brings the transformation? Who brings the change? Who is the one that really helps transform people's hearts? God is. And now here's where we're going to get into the crowns that you guys hopefully have. And if you don't have a crown, you'll need a crown. There's this scripture. And Isaiah chapter 28, verses 1 through 3. And this is God speaking to the prophet Isaiah, and he says, Woe to Samaria, the crown of pride. Everybody say the crown of pride. The crown of pride of the drunkards of Ephraim, which was the ten tribes of Israel, and to the fading flowers of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley of those overcome and smitten down with wine. Verse 2. Behold, the Lord has a strong and mighty one, the Assyrians, which were the enemies of God's people, that were going to come like a tempest of hail, a destroying storm, like a flood of mighty overflowing waters. He will cast it down to the earth with a violent hand. What's he going to cast down to the earth? The crown of pride which is actually a city. It's a group of people. With alien feet, Samaria, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim, will be trodden down. Do you know what trodden down is? Stomped on. So what's God saying? Here's a group of God's people, actually, the Israelite, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel, that they have become so full of pride. God describes it as a crown of pride that they're wearing. That he is going to allow the cities, he's going to allow those prideful people of his followers to be violently thrown to the ground and stomped on. That sounds pretty rough, doesn't it? Why? Some people would say that pride is the greatest sin of all. And God hates pride. So this evening, what we're going to do right now, and then my goal is to end in the next few minutes, is I want you to take the crown off of your head and have a pencil in your hand. I'm going to give you two minutes. If you don't have a crown, there's crowns in the back table. There's crowns up here in the front row. And I want you to write on that crown areas of your life that you believe you have allowed pride into your life. And don't worry about the person sitting next to you. And if they see it, you don't have to hide it from them. Just be real. We all have pride issues. So two minutes starting now. Just write down anything that's been stirred up through the list that I gave you, the lies we believe, the Savior complex. What areas of pride do you struggle with? Father God, I just pray right now that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, show us. Show us those areas. Like David, who had the heart after God. David, who was a worshiper, would cry out to you, Lord, show me. Show me my heart. Lord, I want to be more like you. I want to surrender all to you. I want you to stir me up. Where are these areas in my life that I hold on to pride? Is it in my freedom to worship? My ability to receive your word? In the way that I I speak to others or allow others to speak to me? My everyday life, is it at work? Is it at home? Just write those things down, and we're going to move on. You can do more of this later. But if our time's up, and I said I wanted to get you guys out of here, what we're going to do is put those crowns on our head. Wear your crown of pride real quick. This is all symbolism. We're not really a crazy church like you think. We are crazy. And if the person to your left or right isn't wearing a crown, tell them to swallow their pride. See, I gave out the nice gold crowns to the last guy that walked in the door, so I have to even wear one of them Terra, Tierra things. 
All right. We all have our crowns on. Let's let's all stand. We're going to do something that I was taught years ago. It's it's something we do just symbolically in the natural that has repercussions in the spiritual, I believe. And so it's repent, renounce and declare. And the greatest thing that we can do to overcome spiritual warfare in our lives, allowing sin to rise up, is to repent from it. Number one, obedience is the greatest tool to winning the victory in spiritual war, warfare. Repent. So we're going to take some time to repent, and you're going to repeat after me. I actually have it up here on the screen, uh, what we're going to read together, and we're going to move fairly fast. Uh, we're going to get to a section where you're going to repeat the list that you wrote down. You can say it quietly or you can say it loudly. There is no pride in here, right? So we're going to repent. We're going to ask for forgiveness. And then when we get done with that, we're going to cast our crown to the ground and we're going to stomp on it, right? Exactly what the scripture said. And then we're going to renounce the spirit of pride in our lives, the lies that, that we have believed when it comes to that. We're going to read a scripture and prayer and then we're going to close out repeating also a declaration of transformation. So we all ready in this? Now listen, say this out loud. If your neighbor isn't saying out loud and you can't hear him, turn to him real quick and say, swallow your pride. Let go of that pride, okay? Don't be ashamed, don't be afraid. This is about Jesus and nothing else. So read this out loud with me. I'm gonna I'm going to read it through the mic just to encourage you guys, but say it out loud with me. Be bold in this. Ready? Father, in Jesus' name, I come to repent of the pride in my heart. Please forgive me for thinking more highly of myself than I ought. Forgive me for judging others or esteeming them unworthy because of my fleshly standards. Forgive me, Lord, for being offended by others when they have disagreed with me. I lay down my right to be right. Forgive me, Lord, for being proud of. Repeat your list. I repent for not humbling myself before you and others. I lay down any rights to understanding God's ways or methods. Turn my heart from pride and grant me a willing spirit to be open and honest about my spiritual walk. And now cast down your crown in the name of Jesus and stomp on that pride in your life. Stomp on it. Come on, somebody. Stomp on that pride. Jump on that thing. Get rid of that pride. Stomp it under your feet. Destroy the enemy in your life. And now ready? We're going to renounce. I renounce. We got it up there? Where are we at here? I renounce the spirit of pride. I renounce the lie that I have to be perfect. I renounce the lie that in order to be acceptable, I have to prove my knowledge and understanding. I renounce the lie that I have to appear better than others. I renounce the lie that I can do this on my own. I yield ultimate authority to you and ask you to cleanse my heart from the sin of pride. According to Philippians 2, 3 through 4, I will do nothing through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, I will esteem others better than myself. I won't only look out for my interests, but also for the interests of others. Now declare this. I desire to be like Jesus, who humbled himself to death on the cross. As I die to my own desires, I choose to embrace humility and walk in love towards others. Please continue to show me any ways in which pride may have entry in my life. Thank you for cleansing me by your blood. I declare my love and devotion to you, the author, perfecter, and finisher of my faith. In Jesus' name, everybody shouts a big, loud amen. Now, the antidote to all types of pride is stated in Scripture. You want the, you want the shot for the virus? James 4, 6. 
and God gives grace generously as the scriptures say God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble this principle is further illustrated in the life of Jesus Philippians 2 6 8 though he was God he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to instead he gave up his divine privileges he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form he humbled himself even further in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross to avoid the sin of pride we need to learn to embrace a life of humility rightly recognizing our position before God who's the author of every good and perfect gift in our life and as we celebrate our many freedoms and privileges let us also reaffirm our dependence upon God by living a life of genuine humility C.S. Lewis the last thing here says true humility is not thinking less of yourself it is thinking of yourself less let's pray father God I thank you for your word tonight Lord though we've come into worship and we have heard your word and we have symbolically stomped on pride I pray that as we leave this building and we go out tomorrow that it will be in a spirit of humility lifting other people up lifting others higher seeing them with your eyes not being afraid or, or too prideful to express who you are in our lives to the world around us even if we have to lay ourselves out just as you did on the cross dying to our flesh dying to our desires that you might be glorified in our lives in jesus name we pray amen